As thousands of government workers start the week without a paycheck, President Trump is defending himself from a pair of Russia-related reports. First, the New York Times reports the FBI launched an investigation into the president after he fired the bureau's director, James Comey, in May of 2017. The Times says officials wanted to know if the president had been working on behalf of Russia. Then the Washington Post reported the president worked to hide details of his meetings with Russian President Vladimir Putin from his own cabinet. Democrats in the House are now promising to hold hearings related to President Trump's meetings with Putin. Earlier today, the president flatly rejected the reports in what is undoubtedly, undoubtedly an astonishing soundbite from a U.S. president. I never worked for Russia. And you know that answer better than anybody. I never worked for Russia. Not only did I never work for Russia, I think it's a disgrace that you even asked that question because it's a whole big fat hoax. Post political reporter Eugene Scott and CBS News Washington correspondent Paula Reed. Paula and Eugene, thanks to both of you for being with us. Paula, I'm going to start with you. Let's discuss that New York Times report about the FBI inquiry into whether the president was secretly working on behalf of Russia. Does this report change what we already know about the investigations into the president? Well, it gives us some more insight into the origins of the Russia investigation and what happened in May of 2017 between the time uh, Comey was fired and when Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein appointed special counsel Robert Mueller. We're now learning during that time FBI agents were concerned that the president may have been compromised uh, either intentionally or unintentionally by Russia. And the president, as you heard there, he was able to see, say, no, I've never worked for Russia. But over the weekend, in a pretty friendly interview on Fox News, he was asked the same question, and he was not actually able to directly answer it. Stunning. Very, very interesting. Okay, I'd like to play another clip from the president when he was asked about the Washington Post report that he seized interpreter notes from a private meeting with Vladimir Putin. Let's listen. I just don't know anything about it. I read it this morning. Uh, it's a lot of fake news. That was a very good meeting. It was actually a very successful meeting. And I have those meetings with everything. I just know nothing about it. It was a very, very successful meeting. We talked about Israel. We talked about uh, the pipeline, that Germany is paying Russia a lot of money. I don't think it's appropriate. We talked about that, talked about many subjects. But I have those meetings one-on-one -on -one with all leaders, including the president of China, including uh, Prime Minister of Japan, Abe. We have those meetings all the time, no big deal. So, Eugene, let's drill down for a moment on the issue of this interpreter. First of all, how large is the groundswell now for Democrats to hear from the president's interpreter? And has this interpreter made any statements so far? Uh, it's quite significant interest in uh, Democrats and especially voters wanting to know more about uh, what happened at this meeting and looking to the interpreter to provide some answers to uh, the, these uh, questions, uh, especially even outside of the Beltway, despite uh, some reporting from Republican lawmakers suggesting that this is only an issue that people in Washington care about. Uh, we have not heard much from the interpreter, although we do uh, know that Democratic lawmakers are trying their best to get her to testify before them. To to provide answers to these questions that the president probably believes he just answered this morning, uh, but leaves a lot to be, uh, be requested in terms of details. And Paula, are there any legal and ethical considerations Democrats need to take into account before possibly issuing a subpoena for the translator? Well, in the past, there have been efforts to try to subpoena translators who have been present during meetings for these two leaders, but they were blocked. But now that House Democrats, they have uh, the majority, they are feeling emboldened, but they may be stymied by executive privilege. It's unclear the extent to which the president may be able to exert his privilege over these conversations. So they were previously blocked on what grounds? Oh, well, the fact that the Democrats weren't in the majority, uh, mm. so Republicans did not allow those subpoenas to go forward. But now that House Democrats are in the majority, they're going to use that to try to subpoena these folks once again. I foresee a big fight over that interpreter for <laughs> sure. Now, Eugene, this drama is all unfolding as the partial government shutdown is on its 24th day. Hundreds of thousands of federal workers are suffering as a result. It doesn't seem the president is budging on demands for a wall and at his price point. So at what point does the pressure become too much for Senate Republicans? 
Well, when I think uh, the blame shifts to Republicans, right now most Americans blame Donald Trump, a smaller percentage blame Democrats, and even smaller percentage blame Republicans. But if we see that pivot um, and blame Republicans, I think Republicans will respond to their constituents. Large numbers of these uh, 800,000 workers live outside of Washington, D.C., uh, and in red states where they sent Republican lawmakers to Washington, D.C., to make sure that they created a country that uh, provided job opportunities and funded resources in their communities that currently are not going funded right now because of the uh, president's desire for a border wall and Democrats' unwillingness to uh, negotiate with him to fund any of it. And so I think what changes changes will come once we see what uh, voters mobilize and motivate their lawmakers to do. All right, Eugene, last week President Trump appeared ready to declare a national emergency to secure that funding for his border wall, but it appears he has since backed off. Is that still an option, and what does his current strategy appear to be? Well, uh, it is still an option. Just this morning, he certainly said that while he has no plans to declare a national emergency yet, he he continues to uh, suggest that he has uh, full authority to do so, and, and, and it's within his power to uh, move forward in that direction, although uh, there's certainly a line of thinking that says that is not the case and that he requires uh, the approval of Congress to do so. And if he didn't need Congress, he probably would have already done it by now anyway. Um, his strategy right now is just trying to double down and communicate to his base that this wall on, on which he campaigned on, he will have built. Uh, regardless of what the Democrats want. But the reality is, regardless of whether or not Democrats do uh, give in to some degree and support the border wall, Trump's campaign promise actually will not be fulfilled because what he campaigned on was that Mexico will be paying for this wall, not the American public. And that's what he's trying to have happen now. Yes, we don't hear him uh, talk about that part of it very often. Uh, Paula, the confirmation hearings for President Trump's new attorney general nominee, William Barr, begin tomorrow. Tomorrow. If confirmed, he would oversee special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation. What do we know about how he plans to approach that role? Well, we have a copy uh, of his opening remarks, and here he talks about specifically the special counsel, right? That's the million-dollar question. He will be the man who's in charge of approving any additional charges that are brought. He's also the one who has a final decision over how much of this report is eventually made public. And in these remarks, he specifically says that he is going to try to be as transparent as he possibly can. He says he believes that the special counsel should be able to go on and do its work. One thing he does not address, though, Tanya, is the issue of recusal doesn't even mention it. So at this point, it appears he has no expectation that he will be asked to recuse from this investigation mm -hmm. based on his prior criticism of the special counsel's investigation to obstruction of justice. But you can bet I'm sure some Democratic senators are going to ask him about that tomorrow. And does he address the fact if, if the president were to ever directly ask him to pull the plug on the investigation, would he have to do so? He doesn't get that specific, but he talks about how he wants the special counsel's work to continue without any kind of political interference. He also says here that the president never asked him for any favors or tried to influence him for any of the things that he will be responsible for. But you know there's going to be a lot of follow-up questions about that tomorrow during these hearings. And then beyond the issue of the Mueller probe, Paula, would Barr have different priorities as an attorney general compared to Jeff Sessions? It was so interesting. There is some overlap here. If you read his remarks, he talks about how he wants to continue Sessions' work on violent crime. He wants to continue Sessions' work on strict immigration law enforcement. But he also says two surprising priorities for him are one are hate crimes. Attorney General Sessions, he was criticized for not doing as much on civil rights as the previous administration. And also Barr says that he wants to focus on election interference. Now that's also especially surprising because that is something that the White House has been reluctant to even acknowledge happened. So the fact that the Attorney General will make that a priority is significant. Well, we will be carrying the hearings live right here on CBSN, as you know. All right, Eugene Scott and Paula Reed, thanks to both of you. Thanks.